Good evening, everyone. You heard, this, you heard the tune just then, so let's turn to number 171, A Shelter in the Time of Storm. Number 171, standing with me. Welcome, by the way, to Crossroads Evening Service. shelter in the time of storm. Secure whatever ill be tied, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary shelter in a time of storm. A shade by day, defense by night, a shelter in the time of storm. Fears, alarms, no foes afraid, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary A shelter in the time of storm. The raging storms may round us beat. A shelter in the time of storm. We'll never leave our safe retreat. A shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary. A weary land, oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, rock divine, oh, refuge dear, a shelter in the time of storm. Thou our helper ever near, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. Pastor. Amen. It's good to be back tonight. Good to see you. And I appreciate you coming out tonight. And we're going to... But I had a good choir practice. I thought that yeah. was a good choir practice. It's, yeah. it's fun, I tell you. Uh, we're practicing the Easter cantata. And um, yeah, it's fun. Tommy's enjoying it. Yeah. When yeah. you're not pulling on his ear. When I'm not pulling on I sat right behind Tommy, and boy, he just... He's just going. Cool. He's going with it, man. He's enjoying every minute of it. It's good to see you tonight. Praise the Lord. Let's uh, ask God to bless our service tonight. Heavenly Father, it is good to be back in your house. Lord, what a pleasure it is to be able to join together and with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, Lord, we thank you for giving us a church that, uh, where we feel your presence, where we feel the love of the brethren, where we know that your word is going to be brought forth, Lord, in truth. Uh, Lord, I, I pray that you'd help each one of us to be challenged tonight by your word. Oh, God, we need to be challenged. Help us not to be complacent. Help us to strive to grow closer to you and be more like you until that day comes where we, uh, even, we see you and we become even as you are. So, Lord, I pray that you would bless this service tonight. I, I think of uh, Eugene having surgery tomorrow. Lord, I ask that you would bless him. Yes. Uh, Lord, in a very, very special way. And Lord, for Jerry, as she's here tonight, and Lord, and I know she's had some tests and things. Lord, I pray that you would continue to bless her. And Roseanne's got a doctor's appointment coming up. And and, and others, Lord, I, I pray that you'd be with uh, Stan tonight. And Lord, touch his body and, and help him. Uh, Lord, Mike Barber. And uh, Lord, just, uh, my, uh, just, just goes on. Tommy Biggs, Lord, I pray that you'd be with our brother Tommy tonight as he's struggling. 
uh, Lord, and others, uh, Lord, I ask that you would be uh, just undertake for them, Lord, that they would know that they're loved and that they're, uh, they're being supported in prayer by your people. Lord, I pray that you'd bless them. Now, give us what we need tonight in this service. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's try number 136. Let's find out how, how long, how far our Savior leads us. 136. Savior leads me, what have I to ask beside? Can I doubt his tender mercy, who through life has been my guide? Heavenly peace, divinest comfort, here by faith in him to dwell. For I know what it be for me. Jesus doeth all things well, for I know whate'er befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. All the way my Savior leads me, cheers each winding path I tread, gives me grace for every trial. My soul a thirst may be gushing from the rock before me. Oh, a string of joy I see gushing from the rock before me. Lo, oh, a spring of joy I see. All oh, the way my Savior leads me. The fullness of his love, perfect rest to me is promised in my Father's home above. When my spirit, clothed in mortal wings, its flight to realms of day, that's my song through endless ages. Jesus led me all the way. This my song through all the ages. Jesus led me all the way. Amen. You may be seated, Pastor. All right. For our announcements tonight, uh, plenty of things going on. It's exciting to see that. Our calendar is starting to uh, to fill up with uh, all kinds of stuff coming up on the on the calendar. Well, be thinking even out into the future. Be think October. We've got a couple of things going on in October that are going to be f just fantastic. We've got evangelist David Corn, who's an illusionist. The guy is fantastic, fantastic. He does a great presentation for the public schools, and we're pray about that. Start praying now about that that he will be able to get into the public schools because of course it's just up to the discretion of the superintendent or whatever and uh, to be able to get him in and what he does is like, uh, like a, a, a morals type of a thing or whatever they would like him to do that would be a theme for the public school that they would want him to do and then with a with a invitation to come to the church on Friday night and so we have that going on and, and I've, I've seen this where Hundreds of people have come to such a thing. So uh, let's be praying about that. That uh, The prayer specifically is that David would be able to get into the public schools. And uh, Brother Kendall is going to be starting to go to, at, at some point this right away in the fall, right? Is that probably when you would, maybe even the end of this year, going and trying to get that uh, access to the public schools. So, uh, but that's something that's not in your bulletin. But uh, t uh, tonight after the evening service, we're going to empty the trailer out here. There's 1,250, 12,000, not 1,200, 1,500. Yes, but uh, thank you. Times 10. 12,000, thank you. Well, you guys really, I appreciate you. I got you. 
I'm getting it coming and going here, you guys. I'm caught in the crossfire, yes. Uh, 12,500. Hallelujah. There you go. Uh, of the uh, John and Romans in France, we're going to unload those tonight. Uh, remember the last time we did that? It went, it went, it went very, very quickly just because we had many hands. Just sort of a bucket brigade with them and it worked out well. So we're going to do that after the service tonight. But uh, a Tuesday is the ladies' Bible study and then also the assembly time for bearing precious seed. If you've not been out, uh, come on out. It's, it's just collating some scripture, putting some pages together like this, or folding covers, or stapling, or uh, we've got the, 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 the trimmer now that's doing a fantastic job. And so a lot of stuff going on on Tuesday, and then there's a deacons meeting Tuesday night, a Wednesday night Bible study and prayer at 7, uh, kids activity at 645 with truth trackers and tiny trackers and Ignite Teen Club at that time. Uh, also, uh, then we're looking at uh, Saturday being uh, the, that's the youth rally is this next Saturday, correct? Yes, in Gaines, Michigan, and $15 per teen. Uh, and uh, you'll see the rest of them in the bulletin here. I, I want to get this to senior lunch, and we're going to get together again at, at the Silver Grill. And um, that is my phone. Yep. <laughs> Hello? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I owe everybody a pizza. I'm going to shut everything off while I'm standing right here so that doesn't happen again. There we go. I'm sorry about that. Um, and then, uh, but that's going to be at, uh, at 12 o'clock, at 12 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 12 o'clock, noon, high noon at the Silver Grill. Okay, and uh, you know if you're if you're planning on going to that, can you can I get a, just a, a quick count? Is anybody planning on who's planning on going to that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, okay, we got about ten. I'm going to tell them a dozen because usually that's what happens. So uh, uh, that's going to be at noon at the Silver Grill. I hope that you will come. Men's prayer bre breakfast coming up on the 26th, the same date as the ladies quilt, uh, the, the quilting bee. I'm sorry, it's not the ladies quilting bee, uh, the quilting bee, uh, and uh, all this stuff. Well, we got a lot of stuff going on, don't we? Isn't that great? It's great to be able to be involved. Well, ushers, why don't you come at this time and we'll receive our offering. We do have a business meeting next Sunday night after the evening service. And all right, Brother Ron, why don't you pray for us, please? Our Lord, my great Heavenly Father, tonight, of all tonight, we thank you for your blessing and watch you take care of us. Bless this offering plate to pass, and all those that have special needs here, dear Lord, we we'll reach down and touch them and bless them in a special way. We want to thank you again, dear Lord, for your needs here. Amen. waiting for the next verse. Amen. Thank you, Pam. Let's sing together again. Number uh, 135. Stand with me. Turn to 135. Like a shepherd, lead us, Savior.
Savior, like the shepherd, lead us. Much we need thy tender care. In thy pleasure, pastors, feed us. For our use, thy folds prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast for us thine we are. We are thine, do thou befriend us, be the guardian of our way. Keep thy flock from sin defend. When we go astray, blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, seek us when we turn, we pray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear all, hear us when. to receive us sinful though we be thou hast mercy to relieve us grace to cleanse and power to free blessed Jesus blessed Jesus early let Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, early let us turn to Thee. Early let us seek Thy favor, early let us do Thy will. Blessed Lord and only Savior, Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast loved us, love us still. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast loved us, love us still. Amen. You may be seated. Brother Gary will be coming up to sing for us. There's a storm on the horizon, walk me through. As I face the fear and danger, walk me through. When the darkness hovers near, and I don't know what to do, Take my hand, gentle shepherd, walk me through. Walk me through, walk me through. Give me grace to keep my eyes on you. Be 
my comfort, be my guide, shelter me from rising tides. I'm depending, Lord, on you to walk me through. There'll be winds of pains and sadness walk me through. When all hope has turned to sorrow, walk me through. When I grow too weak to stand and I lose sight of the truth, Carry me, O oh faithful Father, walk me through. Walk me through. Walk me through. Give me grace to keep my eyes on you. rising tides. I'm depending, Lord, on you to walk me through. Walk me through. Walk me through. Give me grace to keep my eyes on you. Be my comfort, be my guide, shelter me from rising tides. I'm depending, Lord, on you to walk me through. Romans chapter 5 tonight. I'm going to start there for a minute and then move on. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 is one of those chapters in the Bible where you start reading it, you don't know where to cut it off. You know, so we may wind up reading the whole chapter, I don't know. But Romans chapter 5, and we're going to continue on tonight with what I was attempting to do this morning. I uh, uh, appreciate your patience with that. I, some, some, some things that a preacher will preach, it's, it's a, you know, a very simple four-point outline, three-point outline, and it just, there you go. Uh, I find myself sometimes studying and where God is giving me things, and I'm trying to write them down, and I, I desperately want to assimilate them, put them together in a way that can be a blessing to you. And that's really what preaching is. And uh, sometimes I bite off a big chunk, and it's a little bit harder to put it all together and, and get it out there. But I, I appreciate your patience this morning, and um, I, I really think for the most part I had you with me this morning. And, uh, but we're going to continue with this in Romans chapter 5. What a wonderful chapter. We're going to read some together tonight. Why don't we uh, stand for the reading of the Word of God in just out of respect for the Word of God tonight. And in verse 1 of Romans chapter 5, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience and patience experience and experience hope. 
And hope maketh not ashamed. There's a word tonight that I want to be looking at. Not ashamed. And hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's a good place to say amen, isn't it? My, oh my, what a great verse. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. <laughs> wow, this is just great, isn't it? For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all, that all have sinned. For unto the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is a figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift." For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification." For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one the free gift came upon all men unto the justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous." Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Wow, what a great passage of Scripture. Uh, Lord, I pray that you bless the reading of your word and bless the message tonight. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated. I in no way am going to try to reteach what I was teaching this morning, preaching on this morning, but I can very quickly uh, recap this. The fact is, folks, is that we are all sinners. We all have a problem. It's a common problem. Uh, not only red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in His sight. Red and yellow, black and white all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every social strata, every, uh, every gender, every... And by the way, there's only two. Okay, I thought I'd just throw that in there. i got to clarify things anymore. Okay. <laughs> Never thought I'd see the day. Uh, but uh, you, you can violate God's law ignorantly. You can violate God's law without premeditation, unintentionally. Or you can violate God's law willfully uh, in a premeditated fashion regardless of how you violate God's law. We have all violated God's law. And in Romans chapter 5, take that home with you tonight. Read through Romans chapter 5 a couple of times because it makes that very evident. It's very clear uh, that not only are, are, are we all sinners and condemned to die under the law, we have all been offered eternal life through the atonement of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what a wonder, and the hope that comes from that. This, that chapter is an uplifting chapter. I mean, there's a whole bunch of encouragement in there for us, and, and we sure could use some good news, couldn't we? And that's my line when I hand somebody a track, one of our, our not ashamed of the gospel tracks. We could use, I got some good, you could use some good news, couldn't you? Oh, yeah, I could use that. Here's some good news for you, and hand them a track. Uh, so uh, we all violate the law. We are all under sin. We're all guilty. Uh, and we have, there's two types of guilt. There was the legal guilt that we all have sinned, and then the guilt that we bear, which is really uh, more of a, a feeling that we, that we bear. We, uh, I feel guilty. 
I suffer from a guilty conscience. Some people may have a guilt complex. Okay, it's how you feel. What you are, your legal standing, is guilty under the law. How you feel is, I feel guilty. And that's where conscience comes in. That's where uh, conviction comes in. And so uh, we had here on our, on our board, and I, 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 I think I can promise you, no, I won't promise you, I'm not going to write anything more on this board. I'm not going to shake that pen up, that's for sure, but <laughs> kind of the spots all over it. But we have legal guilt, we're guilty, and then we have personal guilt, I feel guilt. You know, there are some people out there, we, got, uh, we look at this, there's four different quadrants on there. Uh, first, we see those that uh, uh, have legal guilt, but they don't sense any personal guilt. By the way, I said psychopath this morning. I'm not really big on those, those labels. It's, it's sociopath. A sociopath is someone who has no guilt. They just no conscience. They can, they can lie to you and not feel one bit of, of remorse about it, no guilt at all. Um, and so whether you're, okay, you have legal guilt, and some people have no personal guilt, that's deception and a lie. We have some who feel, and this is more typical, people that have, are guilty uh, under the law and then have some kind of conscience, some kind of conviction, uh, some kind of a, uh, a feeling of, of guilt, and that's over here, okay? So we have those at legal guilt and no personal guilt, deception, legal guilt and feelings of personal guilt, we say conviction or conscience. And then we have this over here, no personal guilt, and we talked about this, no personal guilt and no legal guilt. This is found in Romans chapter 5, that atonement. What happens is your debt's been paid. So legally, under the law, it's all been fulfilled. Okay, uh, we, we have, we've been redeemed. The price has been paid, and that the only price that could be paid is either there's two eternal eternal damnation in hell, and by the way, you'll never have that one paid. We can't even make a payment on the interest. Okay, condemnation and damnation in hell for all eternity, or we escape hell through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. There's no other way. There's no other way. Uh, the Lord's Supper doesn't do that. The baptistry doesn't do that. Good works doesn't do that. It doesn't save anybody. Being a church member doesn't do that. A lot of church members are going to be in hell and a lot of people are going to go to heaven who never, hardly ever darkened the door of a church. It's because what they did with Jesus gets us to heaven. Okay? So over here we have now, we've accepted Christ and we've allowed Him to do a work in our life uh, and we have healing, we have forgiveness, we have new life. Now, as you notice, there was one more section in here, one more quadrant that we were dealing with, and that is those that have no guilt, no legal guilt. You're a Christian, you've trusted Christ, but you still have personal guilt. And I put a word there, I put the word caged. Caged. Christians in bondage. In my several decades now of pastoring, being involved in the ministry and counseling, and I've done a lot of counseling, I would say in my counseling, for every person who's got that idea that they're better than everybody else, and they have that concept in their mind that, you know, they're God's gift to humanity, um... Uh, for every person like that, I've probably met a dozen people who are over here. They live their life in shame. Condemnation. Condemnation by God? No, there's no condemnation to those that are in Christ, who walk after the Spirit. No condemnation. It's not condemnation by God. That's all been taken care of. You got that legal guilt. Now we're not guilty because we have trusted Christ. The only ones that make it on the other side of this line here 
with legal guilt and being found not guilty, right here is the blood of Christ. And so the Christian is going to reside in this, at least in this concept, with no personal guilt, or they're going to carry personal guilt into their life. Now, what I want to address tonight, there's this morning's message. I don't want to get that gooped up again, Joe. <laughs> How does a Christian deal with the guilt in their own life? I mean, I, I tell you, I've, I've had people, I've had people sit in my office at different times, and they won't even look me in the eyeballs. I mean Christians, because of an overwhelming sense of guilt. And sometimes it's, it is, it's some, they, they've been a perpetrator. They've hurt other people. How do they find that grace? How do, they, how do they find the relief from a guilty conscience? Because God has, uh, 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 Lord Jesus come that in, in John chapter 10 and verse 10, the, the thief has come to, but for to kill and to uh, kill, steal and destroy. But Jesus said, but I am come that you might have life abundantly, even more abundantly. Abundant life, that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. God wants us to have abundant life regardless of the sin that we've committed in our past. Now that sometimes is hard to swallow when you consider some of the things that people have done in their life. Sometimes the biggest enemy for somebody having peace in their life with God is the brethren who will never let them get over their own sin. You know, folks, that's not happening around here, is it? Help me out. That's not going to happen around here. Need a fresh start? This is a good place to have a fresh start. Need some help? This is a good place to get help. Need, need to have some blessing in your life? This is a good place to have that. You know, there's some things as a pastor I will sort of back away from a little bit. I don't want to be overly offensive to it, but you know what we're never going to have? We will never have, as, as me as the pastor, we will never have a judgmental church. We never will. We won't do that. I couldn't stand in front of you if we had a judgmental church. How could I do that? I know my own sin. I know how black my heart can be, my heart has been. And I know the grace that God has given me in forgiving me of my sin and giving me new life. And everybody is supposed to have that opportunity. Everyone has that opportunity. Why do we feel guilty when we sin? Well, one reason is we know that we have offended God. That would be a natural response to our sin, wouldn't it? Uh, so uh, guilt is not necessarily a bad thing. We would associate that with conviction, the conviction of the Holy Spirit. We know we've offended God, and often that brings guilt in our life. Uh, how about this? We have violated our own standards of right and wrong. Have you ever done something and then felt ashamed of yourself? Mm, this is not testimony time. Don't worry. We're not going to pass around the microphone. But I believe that. I believe that everybody in this room would be heading for the door. If we said, I've got a machine up here, and we're going to put, these, this, put, your, put this uh, uh, vegetable strainer on your head, and when we put this thing on your head, it's going to project everything you've ever thought is going to be up here on the screen. I think what would happen is we would be headed for the door, okay? We would all be headed for the door. Yeah, so, uh, you know, we've often violated, you know, and, and, and you do it, and you don't want to do it, and you know you're not supposed to do it, and you do it anyhow, and then there's guilt that comes along with that. Well, of course there is. Uh, over in, uh, I, I was looking at different scripture on this, and then over in uh, John chapter 8, I want to look there very quickly, because it's in John chapter 8, in verse 9, our scripture says here, this is when, 
where the, they had caught this woman in the act of adultery, and they brought her to Jesus. And uh, we see in chapter 8 and verse 3, And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. Isn't it interesting? I don't read where they brought the man. Okay, it's very interesting. Uh, and so this woman taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. It said in verse 5, but what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him that they might have to, uh, ha might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down with his finger, wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. And I'm not sure what he wrote in the ground. I don't know. Okay, and whether that was really the principal issue here, but God did not tell us what he wrote in the ground. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. Okay, now just, I don't know if Jesus wrote some scripture on the ground. That's really what I would think. Is it some, some, some type of scripture or something that he wrote on the ground? But whatever happened there, it's as if God moved into that setting and these men decided, uh, they started dropping the rocks out of their hands and walking away. Because they, in their own conscience, they recognized that this wasn't right. You without sin cast the first stone. And so we have violated our own standards of right and wrong. Many times we violate our own conscience, and that's why we have feelings of guilt. Uh, maybe we carry a sense of failure. Ever felt like that? Ever felt like a failure? Ever felt like you just couldn't get anything done right? Uh, it would never, uh, you could never accomplish anything? Uh, you know, uh, how about this? this are words. These are words of condemnation uh, that maybe go through your head. You're stupid. That's just an ugly word. But that word goes through my mind from time to time. You're stupid, you're incompetent, you're foolish, you're an idiot. All those nasty words go through my, my head at times. And, 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 and why? Because I did something that was stupid. That's why. I did something that I shouldn't have done, or I thought something I shouldn't have thought, or I said something I shouldn't have said. We carry a sense of failure. Or maybe this, why do we feel guilty when we sin? We live with the awareness that we've hurt others. Oh my, that's a tough one. That's a tough one when you've hurt somebody else. And now you, you have to live with the fact that you hurt somebody else. Oh, how many words we would take back if we could. My Wish we could rewind the tape and have a, have a, a do-over. Maybe I wouldn't have said it that way. Maybe I wouldn't, because you ever say something, especially when you're dealing with children, it's just horrible when it's, when it's your own child and you say something and you know that that was way more harsh than it needed to be and sharper than it needed to be. And I think every one of us as parents have done something like that sometime in our life. And some people make a habit of it, honestly. And you see the look on that child's face. And you know that you just hurt somebody that, I mean, you'd die for them, but you just wounded them. And now you carry, you carry that guilt. Why do we feel guilty when we sin? Often we live with the awareness that we have hurt others. So what happens when we sin then? We have personal guilt, which causes depression. If we allow that personal guilt to just be maintained, it causes depression. It causes hopelessness. And we read in Romans chapter 5 about hope, about having hope. We have hopelessness. When we're overrun with personal guilt, often we will have fear. Fear. You know, sometimes we do things in secret and then we're worried that some are going to be made manifest out in the daylight and somebody's going to find out, live in fear. Personal guilt 
bring cynicism about oneself. I am never going to be able to get over this. I am never going to be anything for God. I am never going to be able to be the husband that I need to be for my wife. I'm never going to be able to be the father for my children. I'm never going to be able to be the pastor that I need to be. I'm never going to be the Sunday school teacher I need to be. I'm never going to be a friend uh, like I really wanted to be. I, I, I've hurt people that I love and I causes me now to be cynical about myself. It also causes me to isolate. Guilt causes people to isolate, not want to interact quite so much with others. Uh, guilt uh, causes us to experience loneliness. Loneliness. Well, the Bible is very clear about, about friends. If you want to be friendly, if you want to have friends, you've got to sort of put yourself out there. When there are feelings of guilt and insecurity about ourselves, often what happens is that person will step back as the world passes by. Never really participate. Never really get involved. Why? Because they're in a cage of their own guiltiness. Now remember, in this quadrant that we're talking about here, this is not God that's bringing that in. That means your sin has already been forgiven. What goes on in this quadrant right here, God has forgiven us, but we have a hard time forgiving ourselves. Oh my, that's desperation. I just pause, not because I don't know what to say. I pause because just a flood of faces and names. For many years, you all, you all know this, for 15 years my wife and I dealt with college students. I was vice president of two different Bible colleges and did a lot of teaching, did a lot of counseling. My wife was the principal counselor for all the ladies. I was a principal counselor for all of the men. And I just, just right now, I just, it almost causes me not to be able to concentrate. I just, I see these people they're, they're flow, it's flowing through my mind. I, I, can't, I can't even begin to relate to you some of the stories, uh, uh, the shame that people bear. The shame. I, I, I just, it's some of those things, especially when you get to those things of an intimate nature, uh, shameful things that have been laid on in, into the life, into the conscience of young adults who now are fractured, they're broken, they're living, although they have been free from, the, from their debt of sin, they, they have legally, uh, they're not, they've been out no longer guilty. Uh, they're children of God, but yet they're living in a cage because of what they've done or what's happened to them. And they're hopeless, they're, they're, they're withdrawn Prayerlessness eventually takes over. Because when you feel like there is no hope and you have an overwhelming sense of guilt, do you really want to go and talk to your father? Eventually, it leads to prayerlessness. Uh, what can happen is reading the Bible then becomes an exercise in condemnation because everything you read in the Bible seems to be pointing a finger at you and your sin. It's a frame of mind. The fruit of the Spirit wilts, and the works of the flesh resume control of the demoralized, guilt-ridden Christian. And I just want to stand on my soapbox here and just tell you this, okay? I just want to tell you this. God does not want you to live that way. That is not the way, any more than you want your child to live that way. God does not want you to live overwhelmed by guilt. That's why He forgives us. I want to beg you, will there become a time where you can forgive yourself? Enter now the adversary. Look over in Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. 
in verse 10. Revelation 12 and verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. Woo! Wow! The old devil is an accuser. We see it over in the book of Zechariah, chapter 3. Uh, the, God gives uh, the prophet a vision of, of, uh, of the... Um, uh, oh, what's the priest's name? Uh, Joshua, the high priest. Uh, his name means similar to Jesus. Okay, Joshua, the high priest, is standing before God's throne, and Satan is standing before, be, beside him on his right hand. This is the position, as I've read in different commentaries, the position of the accuser. It is a courtroom scene. And God is on his throne. And, and we, we see Joshua, the, the son of Josedek, is now standing before the throne of God with Satan, the accuser, next to him. And if you look at this, what you will see is you will see that the, the high priest of God is standing there in filthy garments. So we can maybe fill in uh, between the lines a little bit about what's going on there. You have an accuser standing next to the high priest before the throne of God, the judge of the universe. And what is he doing? He's pointing at him and saying, look at him, he's dirty, look at him, he's filthy. He's in your presence and he's filthy. And I like this, God says, get out of here, devil. And then he said, hey folks, hey, hey, get, hey, get him some clean clothes. Clean him up. And he restores Joshua, the son of Josedek. He restores him to his clean position before the throne of God. And now God sees him, not in a judgmental way, but he sees him as clean and pure and whole. But the devil was standing right there saying, pointing at him, saying, look at him, he's dirty. Look at him, he's no good. Look at him, he's failed. Look at him, he's, he's wicked. God, he's standing in your presence. And you say that he's one of your, uh, he, he's one of your saints? You, sta he, you say that he's one of your priests? God kicks the devil out and cleans up the man of God and puts some new clothes on and puts a new hat on his head. The Bible says he puts on a miter on his head, a fair miter, a clean miter on his head. And restores him. Satan takes notice when a Christian is struggling and turns up the accusations. He lies. He lies. Lie, 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 lie. The Christian who is caged in bondage to guilt and shame is believing a lie. I'm going to say it again. You're believing a lie. It's not true. It's a lie. It comes right from the mouth of Satan himself, the accuser of the brethren. By the way, don't partner with the devil being an accuser of the brethren. Goodness gracious. Somebody's struggling, somebody falls, don't you go and talk to somebody else about it. Fall on your knees and pray for them. Encourage them in the Lord. Let them know that they have a brother or a sister in Christ who loves them unconditionally and is there for them. That's what the body of Christ is supposed to do. The devil lies. The devil lies uh, uh, to us about God. What does he say about God? Oh, he doesn't love you anymore. No sense in going to him anymore. You've prayed, you've tried to confess that sin to him so many times, he's not interested in hearing you no more anymore. That God, he's a, uh, you remember now, God is a God of justice. God is a God of law. God is a God of condemnation. And uh, he just berates the Christian who's fallen. He lies, he lies to us about God. You know what else he lies to us about? He lies to us about others. Everybody's talking about you. Well, first of all, folks, you're really not that important. I've had people say that to me. Say, oh, Pastor, I know everybody's talking about me. 
No, they have a life to live, okay? No, they're not talking about you. But the devil's telling you that they are. And matter of fact, there might be a couple people who are talking about you, and I'm going to tell you there are dozens of people, if they know your circumstances, that are praying for you. See, the devil's a liar. He lies to us about our brothers and sisters in Christ. He tries to put enmity between the saints. He tries to divide the very body of Christ. Why? Because he is a liar and he wants you to feel condemned and he wants you to feel isolated and he wants you to be depressed. He wants you to feel guilty. When Jesus Christ shed his life's blood to free you from guilt and shame. So he tells us lies about God. He tells us lies about others. And you know the biggest lies that he tells he tells us lies about ourself. The accusing words of the devil. And you know, he's not very nice. You ever try to give a cat a bath? <laughs> mm -hmm. You better have on leather gauntlet gloves and leather jacket. Because if that cat has claws, it's going to get right about here and it's going to rip you apart. You know what the devil wants to do? He wants to tear you apart. I, I could be crude. I'm not going to be crude. I, I, I don't like crudeness. But study warfare a little bit to see what some, some armies did to terrorize populations. Well, yeah, even just watch the news. Uh, it's, it's, you know, when you drop a bomb on a hospital, okay, uh, when you, uh, uh, you know, that, but the, see, what the devil wants to do is devil wants to absolutely tear our insides out. And he'll stand there and dance in your innards while you choke on your own blood. Okay? Okay, the devil would do that. I'm telling you why, because he hates you. Not only that, he doesn't just hate you, he hates your father, and he can't get to your father, so he's going to try to get to you. He's going to tell you all kinds of wicked things. He's going to tell you how worthless you are. He's going to tell you how stupid you are. He's going to tell you how unnecessary you are. And then, uh, let me say something to you folks. You read in the book of, uh, book of 1 Corinthians, you read chapter uh, 12, chapter 13, chapter 14. You have a place in the body of Christ and it is encompassed by the love of God and the love that we're supposed to have for one another. You are somebody. You're somebody to God. The devil wants to tell you you're nobody. The devil wants to tell you you're garbage. The devil wants to tell you you're trash. The devil wants to tell you that you're that stuff that they start spreading all over the fields pretty soon. That's what the devil wants to tell you that you are. And I want to tell you something. I got somebody right now I'm dealing with. I'm telling you, I have to tell them over and over, you're precious to God. Oh, God loves you. Oh, no, he doesn't. Yes, he does. He loves you. He loves you. I'm trying to overcome the lies. Oh, he's got me, he's got me. He doesn't have you. He can't have you. Read John chapter 17. He can't have you. But he's going to lie, he's going to lie, he's going to lie to you about you and tell you how useless and worthless and uh, uh, no value you are. He's a stinking liar. Unfortunately, sometimes preachers help him out. We've got to be careful. Teachers, preachers, we better be careful. I heard a preacher one time get up in church where he was an evangelist. And he got up in one of our chapel services at the college. What he didn't know is we had probably two or three young ladies in that auditorium who had some horrible things happen to them. And they had participated in some horrible things. And they had uh, one of these girls had just near, nearly killed herself and my wife was intensely counseling several young ladies two or three young ladies at the time telling them how valuable they are to God because they felt like absolute trash because they had allowed themselves to be used and abused and they were cutting themselves they were anorexic uh, one girl walked, walked into her room and she was curled up in a fetal position 
um, and, and nigh on to death. Her kidneys were starting to shut down. Um, the doctor told her, eat or die. And uh, it was all about guilt. It was all the, what, what she, the lies that she was believing. We had a preacher get up and he said, ah, some of you out there. He said, you go and you let, you girls, you let some guy use you. And then who's going to want to marry used goods like you? And it started in my toes. And it started creeping up. I walked out of the room. I was so, by the way, two of those girls started cutting again right after that. And I went to the preacher and I said, if you ever have this man come again, I'm giving you fair game, fair, fair warning, fair warning. If he ever does that again, I'm going to stand up and rebuke him in the name of Jesus right in front of everybody. And you will have a happening. There will be a happening because it will not happen in front of me again. Why? The old devil is just trying to beat the living daylights out of people and he doesn't need the help of preachers to do it. We can talk about sin and our relationship to God and our needs of confession and repentance without condemning people with demonic, satanic lies. He lies to us about God. He lies to us about others and he lies to us about ourselves. You know, Job did all right when God put all the, the pressures on him and took all of the, uh, the blessings away from him and how he was afflicted and all of those sort of things. Even his wife turning against him. He did just fine until his friends came along and started criticizing him and he started believing their criticism. Read the book of Job. So here we are, we have Christians who have been saved by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, Romans chapter 5. Saved, they're now, no, they're not guilty, standing before the judgment seat of uh, uh, ju the, the God's judgment throne. They're not guilty, they're going to be at the judgment seat of Christ, not the great white throne judgment. If you're going to be at one judgment, you don't want to be at the great white throne, Okay. A uh, great white throne judgment, the con that's a, a judgment of condemnation. The judgment seat of Christ is a, is a judgment of our works, whether they be good or whether they're evil. Okay? Christians go to the judgment seat of Christ. And they've gone now and been found not guilty. Not guilty. But yet they're caged by their own personal feelings of guilt. How do I break free of personal guilt to live in the fullness of God's healing? This is where we want to be over here. This is the abundant life. This is the fruitful Christian life. This is walking in the Spirit. This is, this is abiding in God's presence. This is where there's fullness of joy. Uh, this is where there's peace. This is where the mercy comes down. This is where the grace comes down. This is, when we, this is where we edify one another. This is where we worship God. This is where we have that abundant living is found over there, uh, right here, when we are free from God's uh, uh, guilt. Legal, we're free from legal guilt, and we're not guilty from personal guilt. Those feelings of personal guilt, how do I get over there? First of all, speak truth. Speak truth to whom? To yourself. Speak truth. Speak truth. Oh, I've got that here somewhere. What's that? Is it? There it is. It's in my other Bible. I carry this around. I carry this thing around. I, I'm going to make up some more of these and get them laminated. I carry this thing around. It, said, it says, you have every right to be free. In Christ, I am accepted. John 1.12, I am God's child. Romans 5.1, I am Christ's friend. John 15.15, 15, I have been justified. 1 Corinthians 6.17, I am united with the Lord and one with Him in spirit. 1 Corinthians 6.20, I have been bought with a price, I belong to God. 1 Corinthians 12.27, I am a member of Christ's body. Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, I am a saint. Ephesians 1.5, I have been adopted as God's child. Ephesians 2.18, I have direct access to God through the Holy Spirit. Colossians 1.14, I have been redeemed and forgiven of all my sins. I am secure. Colossians 2.10, I am complete in Christ. Romans 8.1 and 2, I am 
free from condemnation. Romans 8, 28, I am assured that all things work together for good. Romans 8, 31 through 34, I am free from any con condemning charges against me. Romans 8, 35 through 39, I cannot be separated from the love of God. 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22, I've been established, anointed, and sealed by God. Colossians 3, 3, I am hidden with Christ in God. You feeling it yet? Uh, Philippians 1, 6, I am confident that the good work that God has begun in me, he will be perfected. Uh, Philippians 3.20, I am a citizen of heaven. 2 Timothy 1.7, I have not been given the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Hebrews 4.16, I can find grace and mercy in time of need. 1 John 5.18, I am born of God, and the evil one cannot touch me. I am significant. Matthew 5.13, I am the salt and light of the earth. John 15.1 and 5, I am a branch of the new vine, a channel of his life. John 15.16, I have been chosen and appointed to bear fruit. Acts 1.8, I am a personal witness of Christ. 1 Corinthians 3.16, I am God's temple. 2 Corinthians 5.17-20, I am a minister of reconciliation. 1 Corinthians 6, 1, I am God's co-worker. Ephesians 2, 6, I am seated with Christ in the heavenly realm. Ephesians 2, 10, I am God's workmanship. Ephesians 3, 12, I may approach God with freedom and confidence. Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. I carry that in my Bible. Why do I carry this in my Bible? I carry this in my Bible because I have to tell myself the truth sometime. I read the whole thing because I want you to know it. I read that. I read that on a daily basis. Sometimes I read that more than once a day. Why? Because the devil doesn't give up. You're no good. You're worthless. You're guilty. Why would God ever love you? Why would God ever use you? Why should anybody ever listen to anything you have to say? You're no good. You're, you're not a good preacher. You're not a good Christian. You're not a good child of God. You're not a good husband. You're not, uh, uh, you're not a good father. You're not a good papa. Uh, you're not a good friend. The devil tells me that all the time. I don't know if he tells you that or not. He doesn't give up. He goes back and digs into the boneyard and brings to memory those things that I've done that I'm ashamed of and wants to put that shame back on me once again. I have to say, wait a second, I'm forgiven. Wait a second, there is no, therefore no condemnation. Why? Because I am in Christ and when I'm in Christ, I am free from the law of sin and of death. I must claim that. I claim that on a routine basis. If I didn't, I would slip into guilt and depression and isolation. Maybe you're not susceptible to that. I don't know anybody who is, uh, who's not susceptible to that, quite honestly. Speak the truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Get in the word of God. Get in the book. Get quiet with God. Spend time in prayer. Secondly, practice steps of repentance. We see in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. That's a whole other message. Okay, we're already longer than I wanted to go tonight. But you read in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, uh, true steps of repentance. Some of the reasons why we hang on to the guilt is because we really, have we confessed it? Sure. Are we right with God? Yes. But we go right back to it. Why? Because we haven't repented of it. There are steps to repentance in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 that lead us to a sorrow after a godly sort that causes us to not want to go back to that same sin. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Number three, how do we get out of that? How do we get out of that, that, uh, that quadrant? Forgive those who have hurt you. The standard is Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32. And how many times we read in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 21, to infinity you forgive. You know, somebody hurts you, maybe they hurt you very badly. And you feel like you're over it. And then all of a sudden it creeps up on you and it hits you again. And you're like, man, that dirty dog. I can't believe they did that. <laughs> you know what we got to do? We got to forgive again. And forgive again. And forgive again. Sometimes it's multiple issues. I got to forgive that person. Then they did it again. I got to forgive them again. And they did it again. And I got to forgive them again. Sometimes they only did it once, but I keep remembering it. And I keep holding it against them, and i got to go back and forgive them again. Don't stop doing that. Don't stop doing that. You want to stay over here where the, there's abundant life, and not over here in the, in the, in the guilty uh, quadrant of this, uh, this diagram here in front of us? Uh, forgive them, and forgive them, and forgive. And then fourthly, forgive yourself. Forgive yourself. 
That may be the hardest thing to do. You know, some of us, we might have to go to a cemetery somewhere because the person that we've offended is already gone. I suggest you go there. Write them a letter. Stand there and read them a letter and apologize. And then try to find some peace in forgiving yourself. Sometimes we need to make restitution. You stole something? Make restitution. You've done something that you know you shouldn't have done? You hurt somebody? Apologize. You know what that does? It allows you then to forgive yourself. If it's open, it's still just a wound. Folks, we, God does not want us to live in a cage. Abundant Christian living is free. It's ours if we want it. Heavenly Father, help us, Lord, to... Oh, God, help us, Lord, to...